Good evening and welcome to Talking Songs with me, Roland Jones. How are you all doing out there? I have to say it has been terminally grey and miserable in Manchester today. Some people think it's always like that, but it's not. It's not. It's definitely not. It can be a bright and cheerful place. Just not today. Um, so what have I got today? Well, today I'm going to sing a song for a start. And... Um, this is, um, this is a song called Where's the Why? Tired of waking up on my own I have a house but I don't have a home So lonely living life all by yourself Don't like living up on a shelf, where's the why? Where is the you? Where's the why? Where is the you? It doesn't worry me all of the time. It just appears with no reason, no rhyme Sometimes I see somebody smile I'd like to be there every once in a while Where's the why? Where is the you? Where's the why? Where is the you? I'm getting older and I'm getting tired Drunk too often, getting wild I don't know how long this can last Life's going slower but time's going fast Where's the why? Where is the you? Where's the why? Where is the you? You might be tall and slender with long blonde hair. You might be repetite, I don't really care. As long as your mind works and your heart is true. I don't care if your eyes are green, brown or blue. Where's the white? Where is the you? Where's the why? Where is the you? Where is the you? Where is the you? Where is the you? Mm -hmm. oh. I'm sure the guitar players out there will recognize this, that that's the sort of riff that if you just drift off at any point during it, it's almost impossible to pick it up again. You have to get back to the start of it and go over it. So it's nothing worse than being interrupted in the middle of that song. It's like, ah, can't do anything about it. So anyway, I have with me this evening a gentleman called Mr. Dave Arcari. Well, oh, hang on. David, <laughs> Dave, hey, how are you doing, hey, man? Ryan. Good, thanks, man. What about you? I'm all right. I'm all right. How's, how's tricks? Where are you exactly? Oh, you're in Loch Lomond, uh, are you? I'm on the eastern shores of Loch Lomond. Um, a wee studio here is right on the shores of Loch Lomond. So, uh, yeah, nice place to be, but kind of wet and windy. Very, very <laughs> wild and windy at the moment. I, I, I was envious that you posted something a few, I don't know when it, I saw, oh, I saw it a few days ago, but you, I don't know when you posted it. And you'd said, I'm not going to sit at home and have my cheese sandwich for lunch. I'm going to go down by the lake. And I was <laughs> seriously envious of the potential of being able to say, I'll just go down to the lake. <laughs> oh, man, well, do you know, I, I'm, I, I'm a, bit, a, bit, a bit OCD about food. A lot of people right. uh, love doing barbecue, they smoked, smoked stuff, we've got a, Built a bit in the garden for for doing um, 
brisket and ribs and chicken. All oh, right. Pork, well, any, any kind of smoked or barbecue stuff. Right. Can do it. Yeah, but also like doing pizzas and uh, <laughs> you, often for lunch, I'll maybe make seafood ramen or something. And wow. uh, I, I was sitting in the studio last week and I realized it was nearly lunchtime and I hadn't kind of. Usually, I think I need to get either get things out of the freezer or leave things lying about. And I thought, <laughs> man, well, it's lunchtime in about fifteen minutes, and I've not, I've not, I've not even thought about it. You're not prepared. It. No, so of course, panic with the OCD panic sets in. So I thought, right, shit, it's going to have to be a cheese sandwich. <laughs> now, there's nothing wrong with a cheese sandwich. Nothing at I'm all, mate. Nothing at all. A cheese sandwich is something that I'll have as a snack. It's not a fucking. Well, it's not a meal. It's not a big deal. <laughs> So, so I'm, I'm kind of, I agree with you. <laughs> you know, even even two or three cheese sandwiches still isn't a meal. That's no. why, uh, you know, there's a bit of a belly and tits thing going on here. <laughs> anyway, to make it a bit more exciting, I thought, I know, I'll just jump the bike and go go a few miles up the loch side to a nice wee spot that I know. I mean, I could have it just basically gone out the door, but I thought maybe if I, if I if I go a bike ride, I can eat an extra sandwich. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Uh, okay, then. But where should we start? Where did music start for you then, Dave? Oh, God. Um, well, uh, I mean, as, as far as my, my, my dad, who would have been, if my dad was still alive, he'd have been 114 this year. Right. No. Yes. 1908, he was born. So he was an older dad, let's say, because I'm, mm. I'm only 20. <laughs> I'm only 20. And uh, so he was an older dad. And uh, he played guitar a bit. And it, actually, I've, he was he was pretty good. It was very mm. basic, you know, three, three chords and the truth. Yeah. And, and you know, a wee bit of, sort of bass runs and hammer-ons and stuff. Of course, as a kid, I thought it was crap because it wasn't a, it wasn't pop music. It wasn't rock and roll. It was like mm. kind of folk sort of, you know, but th- things that yeah, yeah, yeah. would have sung in the, in the 1920s. But not... Things we would have sung here, not 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 blues or Americana or country. It was yeah. just kind of, it was like middle middle of the nineteen twenties equivalent of middle of the road. Yeah, I thought it was crap. Anyway, of <laughs> course, I didn't start appreciating them until after he died, which is so often the mm. way. Um, so uh, you know, my, my dad played a bit of guitar at primary school. I tried out on the fiddle. Mm. That was miserable because the teacher was a real bad tempered cow. <laughs> I didn't get on with her at all, and she didn't get on with me. Uh, we had music lessons really just involved the class sitting in front of a teacher playing the piano mm. and singing. I knew a man called Michael Finnegan. He knew whiskers <laughs> on Finnegan. When he came out and blew them in again, poor old Michael Finnegan, begin again. I didn't even remember it. And I wasn't allowed to be in the choir because I was apparently tone deaf and flat. Well, some things never change. Mm. And... Uh, I was allowed, there was there was one big concert in the city halls in Glasgow, and I think it must have been Glasgow schools or something. They mm. have all these choirs from the, from the primary schools. And uh, I was only, but you know, it had been, been terrible not to be part of it, or you didn't, mm. they didn't want any of the kids. Even then, they were wary enough not to, not to make any of the kids feel like rejects, mm. you know, mm. even though I was a huge reject. Uh, and, and not just physically, I was a reject <laughs> academically as well. And uh, I was allowed to be in the choir, but only if I just moved my lips. <laughs> so, uh, so I didn't really get off to a very good start. Mm. And then it wasn't really, I mean, I started listening seriously to music. I mean, I, I had my favourite pop stars and stuff when I was maybe six or seven. Mm. I probably, it was probably about 12 before I started really listening to music. Mm. But the people I'd, I'd liked as a kid, like folk like Alvin Stardust, mm. Shawadi Wadi, a, a lot of it was that sort of 70s mm glam pop take on 50s rock and roll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, of course, when I heard people like Elvis' Sun Sessions and Gene Vincent and the early Sun Sun Years Johnny Cash stuff, I loved all yeah. that. But I didn't know what it was, but I loved the sound of it. Mm. So that was probably why I liked people like Alvin Starr, because he was kind of like a pop Gene Vincent, I guess. Mm, absolutely, yeah, yeah. And... Uh, there's a whole a few Alvin Starr stories, but that, that's probably for later or another time. Yeah. <laughs> unless unless we're on till midnight. Um, <laughs> I, yeah. I think with with you and me, it could be a series. This actually, but <laughs> I think for tonight we'll try and stick to the hour. So, so, so what, what age were you, what age were you when you started playing the guitar seriously? Do you think? 
uh, I, I left school. I was working at a day job in a bank. Mm. You get a day's extra holiday in December, Christmas bonus to go and but do your Christmas shopping. And I just went to Biggers on Sucky Hill Street and bought a guitar. Mm. Harmony Sovereign, steel strung guitar, 49 Oof. quid. Uh, I was told it would be under the bed, and I was like, nah, you, that'll be the last place it ends up. So I basically just taught myself to play Bobby Dylan songs and stuff. And st- but I have you still have you still got it? Have you still got the harmony? No, sadly not. Because as time goes on, I realised that harmony guitars were they were like Stellas, you know, they were they were quite. I, I think Lead Belly played a nine string harmony sovereign or a seven string or the next string um, or something. Nine, I think somebody somebody played a nine. I've got Can't something think of... about that in my in my mm. vague memory. Mm. So, but before I could even play, really, I, I thought, I think I might be able to do something with this. And I just wanted to, to have fun. Mm. And I only knew two, at the beginning, the first two chords were on C and E minor. Mm. And I went out into City Hall Street. Well, actually, it was on Gill Street in Glasgow. And I went, uh, ground control to major tom. <laughs> And I did that two lines and repeat for about an hour and a half. And it made four uh, grand. I did... <laughs> well, I made enough money to go to the Vicky Bar and the Brigitte and get a couple of pints and a, and a couple of... <laughs> used to do these these cheeseburgers in their microwave, which sounds revolting, but they were actually really good. Well, as as an as a 18-year-old, they were, I thought they were good. I probably wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't wipe my shoe wet now. But anyway, that's yeah. because my culinary tastes have expanded. So that was the start of it all, really. Brilliant. So, okay, let, I think it's time we should have a song then. For me? For yeah. <laughs> no, 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 it's all down to you now. Oh, sure. I want, no, I want I to hear the, the Dave, Ar- Dave Arcari compositions and tell us about oh, them. Right. Sure, I don't know if I was that prepared for this, right? Okay, here we go. <laughs> Finger picks at the guitar. I'm in a funny stool here. Oh, a bottleneck would be a good start as well. Let's see what's... Let's see what's going on here. I wonder if anybody's watching. Oh, there's loads of people. Uh, well, at, at least the, at least the. Yeah, Neil, Neil Madden, Dorothy Mullen, John Dickinson, Dorothy. Good evening, Dorothy. Eddie, hello, Eddie. Stacy Derriman up in the northeast of England. Oh, hello, that's Eddie. Lovely. Nice to see you. Right. This, hello, Dave. Uh, hello, right. Yes. Well, <laughs> I have to say, there's only one name there I recognise. So that... <laughs> Oh, no, there's two names I recognise. <laughs> Mr. G.J. Armstrong. Um, hey, and Eddie. Oh, Eddie's Eddie has been on the show. Um, Grand. But somebody's written Springsteen with an exclamation mark. And <laughs> to play, uh, no, now, listen. Somebody, at the end of my... I do a live stream every, every Monday night. In my right. Group. I've got a group called Dave Arcadi's Wildcats. I just got sick of flinging all the free content out there all the time. Yeah, and as you as as you found out in our wee chats previous to this, I'm kind of bloody minded. So uh, <laughs> I thought, no, if you you want the free shit, you got to you got to be in my group. So uh, one person in particular, at the end, I usually I started throwing in a, a least expected cover version, and somebody said, "Play a Springsteen song." I was like, "Jeez!" <laughs> so the next week I was like, "Okay, here we go, Highway Patrolman, Nebraska, best Springsteen album ever." Anyway, this is the David Carey signature guitar from National Resophonic. Got to get a wee plug in for national guitar. Yeah, why not? They looked after me for a long time, and uh, I'm going to play. The, the reason I'm going to I'm going to play a song called Cherry Wine, and the reason I'm going to play this is because if this is if we're talking songs, and there's, mm. I, I'm guessing that there might be some people that write songs or identify with you, yourself or myself, and uh, <laughs> that if you're into songwriting, I, I don't know how you write songs, but. I pick up the guitar and I, I generally fart about a bit. <laughs> Until I get something yep. like, a bit like that. And, uh, <laughs> and then what, what if it doesn't sound too much like something I've done before or any, any, anybody else has done, and it, and it sticks in my head, then I just try and throw some, sing over the top of it, and I'm just singing. It's like that Latin placeholder text you get in word processing and stuff. Yeah, blah, yeah, yeah. Lips, um, blah, 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 blah. Ipsos, and, it's Ipsos sticks it, or whatever it says. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what is it all about? But hey-ho, when I'm writing a song, I kind of do something very similar. And it mm. could be, I could just be singing about the skull in the corner or, mm. or the wall or uh, whatever. 
for some reason, when I was writing this song, the term cherry wine came into my head. Mm. Where from? God knows. Never heard of cherry wine, never, certainly never tasted it, didn't even know if it existed. And somehow it, it became the song and it stayed there. <laughs> Still unknown enough. to me. So there's a huge lesson because a couple of years later I was on tour in the States and we had a day off and there was a, like a Sunday farmer's market in South Bend, Elkhart near South Bend, Indiana. And, we're, and there was this big fuck off barrel with mm. cherry wine written on the side of it. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it, was, it was like half ten in the morning, but I had to try it. No, nope. not good. <laughs> Benelin. That's what it reminded me of. I know there's some weird folk out there that liked Benelin as a kid, but no, medicine, any kind of medicine is no good for me unless it's of the whiskey variety. So, um, <laughs> anyway, the, the moral of that, so, so of course the song is cherry wine, the sweetest thing you'll ever find, and I've just drunk some and it tastes like shit. Mm. So the moral of the story is don't write songs about stuff you don't know about because it'll come back and bite you in the arse. <laughs> but I, I, I continue a whole load of years later to have a laugh at that. So the song's called Cherry Wine. If I can remember it, it goes a bit like this. I was just thinking, is, is it you were talking about that, the idea that how you use the words cherry? You know, the famous story about McCartney and um, yesterday that when he first came up with a tune of that, he sang scrambled eggs. 
because that was the only thing he could come up with. Scrambled eggs. Da, 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 scrambled eggs. Da, 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 da. Oh, wow. <laughs> and if, if you if you read a lot of the, the 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 you know like the great American songwriters did very much the same. Uh, you know they would like <laughs> just um, da, uh, 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 <laughs> till something fitted. But there you go. Oh, so when when did when did your music head across the other side of the uh, the pond? When did that happen? Well, I mean, I don't mean like for, for like pop music, but I mean, when did it get into the, into the sort of bluesy background you've got now? Well, when I started playing guitar, kind of around about the same time I got into, I moved, gone through, listened to a lot of heavy rock, heavy metal, prog stuff. Yep. Then I started getting into Lou Reed and David Bowie. Hmm. And then I kind of got into Bob Dylan and Neil Young round about the time hmm. where I was starting to play guitar. Now, I, th I think that's just something... You know, now it's probably Billie Eilish, Ed Sheeran or whatever that people, uh, <laughs> that kids, you know, when they're starting to play guitar, that's probably or George Ezra or something. That's probably mm -hmm. what, they, what they gravitate to. Maybe 10 years ago, they probably, it was Oasis. And, and mm. the thing is that Bob Dylan wasn't particularly, you know, fashionable or, or, or all, all my pals were listening to like the Human League and, you know, that kind of new romantic crap. <laughs> the new Actually, rheumatics. <laughs> New dramatics. Actually, now looking back, I love that. I, I, I ran a, subsequently. I ran a studio for a long time, and it really opened my ears and appreciation to all kinds of music. Mm. Um, but at the time, as as a kid, you're kind of quite blinkered as far as you. Mm. I don't know what you call it if you put blinkers on your lugs. They're not. I don't know. Blinkered e audio e wise. Earmuffed. <laughs> Earmuffed. <laughs> That's the way to go, man. So, um, so Bob Dylan, the Neil Young thing mm. came, and. None of my pals were interested in the music I was interested in or into playing guitar. Or in, I mean, I could get some of them to listen to Led Zeppelin, but they were mm. more interested in wearing leg warmers and tucking boots and having hair that came down over one eye and all that malarkey. <laughs> um, you know, but the thing is, you go out, you went out in Glasgow like that in the 70s, you'd get chibbed, you know? Mm. So uh, probably by me. <laughs> and, uh, the, so I guess... Uh, it, it, none of my pals would, and then occasionally I would bump into somebody that played guitar, mm. and it would invariably end up being a blues jam. Mm. So, and when I say a blues jam, it was really just a. What you mean is, is a tw twelve bar in E? <laughs> yeah, so, you know <laughs> we've all been there. Bar chord was a, and you know, an endless whittling about and swapping over. So that yeah. kind of got me interested in blues about that mm. time. As well, there was. I, I used to go. Uh, there's a whole load of things in between here about first performances and stuff, but they're, mm. they're, they're not really that relevant. So, but there was a place I used to go to and, and play a few songs every Sunday night. And for some reason, one weekend, one Sunday night, I didn't go there. And there was a pub in Partick in Glasgow mm. uh, called the Exchequer. And a guy you may or may not have heard of him, a guy called Big George, Big George in the business. Hmm. As I subsequently found out, it was an absolute fucking legend. Unfortunately, hmm. he's dead now. Died a hmm. few years ago. But some guy is a big influence on Ian Siegel. He's a big influence on me. Um, right. He didn't really venture far out of Glasgow. He's a, yeah. But if you if anybody wants to check him out, Big George. Right. Big George okay. Is in Glasgow. So they were a blues band. It played down there on a Sunday night, and it, it absolutely blew me away because suddenly I was homing in on the guitar. Mm. Uh, I mean, it was all electric Chicago, Texas blues, mm -hmm. and electric blues stuff. But you know, at that point, I didn't even know what bottleneck was or anything like that. Mm. Um, but I got into that, and as I got into that, I started listening. Instead of getting into people like Eric Clapton and stuff, mm. who I, I thought were all right, but and I liked the Mail, the Beano album, and all that kind of stuff. Mm. But I seem to want to go backwards to like John, John Lee Hooker, Big Bill Brunsey, and John Lee Hooker, mm. Sonny Boy Williamson, um, Led Belly to a certain extent. Mm. Um, but th th these folk really kind of caught my ear. But mm. I, I had no idea how to try and play any of that. <laughs> but I like listening to it, and I, I would kind of try and play John Lee Hooker stuff. I couldn't work out. What I didn't realise was it's actually fuck all to do with it's more it's all to do with timing. It doesn't matter mm. how sparse it is, and it's the timing that's everything. And my timing, I mean, I was playing Bobby Dylan songs in the street. Hey, Mister Tambourine Man! <laughs> and, and I was just I was just changing chords when I felt like it. Yeah, because I'd never played with anybody. Else. I didn't mm. know that 
songs have got a form so that mm. everybody knows what to do. But surely, well, surely with, with the, the thing about, I mean, I, I, I was fortunate when, when we were in the States four years ago, um, I, I played with a, you know, a, a real old school um, blues guy and uh, he, it was a blues museum I went into and this guy was sitting there playing and I said, okay, let's, let's do a few tunes. And he sang the blues as I suspect because his father was a blues player, he was telling us, um, as, as, as his father did. And he didn't stick to a 12-bar structure. He <laughs> sang the line until he'd finished the line, and then he went to the next chord. But it might be four bars in, it might be four and a half, and it, and it was really kind of, I have to say it was tricky to begin with. But, you know, so, so in a sense, you, you, what you were doing was, was more authentic, you know, in the sense of, of not, not counting. Because I rarely play a song the same way twice. Um, mm. I don't know whether that's just because I don't know how to or I can't remember or, <laughs> or what it is. Uh, I, I just have a mental block with timing mm. still. Mm. And uh, an interesting thing is that I, I, I do quite a lot of that like, on guitar, on, 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 online guitar lessons, mm. ongoing guitar lessons for some people, master classes, mm. uh, workshops, all these kind of things. Mm. And quite often people you know, want to maybe be interested in one of my own songs mm. uh, and I think it's a dead simple song until mm. I start to try and explain it and mm. it's all over it's it's so all over the place that mm. people find it hard to get their heads around it because it's not technically difficult mm. but it, there, there's something rhythmically and timing that is completely undefinable yeah yeah you know it's called it's well, probably called repetitive mistakes I don't know <laughs> <laughs> but I mean the thing is I mean if, if you talk talk to most people who've taught whatever it is they do, if they've taught that that interest to other people, that teaching it actually makes you better at what you do because you have to think about it because you'll say, well, you do this, and somebody will say, why? <laughs> um, well, because I always have. <laughs> you know, and then you grind to a halt. Um, and uh, it, uh, I, I found that if I'm t particularly teaching older students... I had a, a, a period of time where I taught a lot of um, like empty nesters. You know, they, the kids had left left home. Suddenly they had money in their pockets and they fancied playing the guitar. So they went out and they bought themselves a brand new Telecaster or a Les Paul or something and found they were playing the same thing as they'd been playing 30 years earlier. So they came to me and I'd try and get them to play a bit of jazzy stuff and things like that. And um, But they'd say, well, why? And I said, well, that's 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 the way it works, you know. <laughs> so yeah, I, but I understand what you're saying is that you're trying to teach something and you you haven't actually consciously learned it yourself. You kind no, of I just do it. Do. Yeah, and you know, there's there's not on many occasions, but I mean, I, I, one of my albums, I think my fifth album, was licensed to a Finnish label called Blue North Records, which is is part of the mm. Finnish Blue Society, and. Uh, that that album is with a couple of pals, a drummer, Honey, and bass player. Um, mm. Uso played on it, and when we recorded it, at Sonic Pump in Helsinki. Mm. And but I generally don't play with other people. Mm. But sometimes, you know, it, there's been two or three times. I can't remember, but it was one of the one of the early USA tours. The first show of the tour was uh, a festival in the Midwest, uh, Blues in the Chippewa. There mm. might even be some people from there watching tonight. Um, <laughs> and uh, they thought it would be a good idea if the, there was a, a house band from Eau Claire, really good bunch of guys, really mm. good players, uh, Lucas and uh, Billy and a oh, great bunch. Now, I'd never met them, let alone played with them. And they thought it would be a good idea for my for them to play with me on my main stage mm. festival set. And I was like, oh, shit, this is going <laughs> to be fun. So I had to try and make pick a set list of the least Raj things yeah. that I played, and there are a few that I mean, like Cherry Wine. There's it's kind of it's, yeah, there's some songs that, that I've got a bit more sense. Than yeah. Other. So, and you know what? I sent them the songs, just a bunch of NPTs or mm. something. Like that. We went on that stage, and man, they you know. We, we had a bit of good visual communication and feedback mm. with each other and stuff. But, as you know, considering I'm all over the place, I, I don't mm. know how they did it. Mm. Well, yeah, I think you said the key <laughs> thing. There was lot, lots of eye contact. 
Because I think one of the things that, that if you watch like particularly young bands, you know, and they're just getting together and they, they might count, they might count the song in and then they ignore each other for the rest of it. And, <laughs> do you know what I mean? They look at their feet. Yeah. Or, or, or pose with their heads back. Um, but yeah, you know, that, that intercommunication thing. And, and that, that I think that's part of the buzz as well, isn't it? You know, we're, that thing when you're playing with somebody else and suddenly you both for no apparent reason do exactly the same thing like you you both go to the same chord or you 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 change an accent or something other and you just find yourself laughing uncontrollably because it's just ridiculous. There's something in the ear you know yeah yeah it, it's something it's something kind of weird but yeah okay let's talk, let's have another song let's have another song well, let's do something different we could play a normal guitar or we could play a banjo. Let's Whichever play a banjo. you like. This has, been, this has been neglected through lockdown. And people don't expect banjos. Largely because a lot of people don't like banjos. Well, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, this... it's, that, it's, it's, the, it's the guitarist joke, isn't it? You know, how, what's the definition of perfect pitch? <laughs> it's getting a banjo into a skip at 400 yards. You know, that, all those jokes. <laughs> And it's, it's, it's funny, you know, on gigs, if, if I have the banjo out in the live show, I always have it kind of like round the corner or behind other things. <laughs> if, if Paul Stewart, who does Pablo on the Blues uh, radio show out at Paisley FM uh, every week, if Paul, if you're watching that, Paul, he, he hates the band. Oh, no, I think he just pulls my leg. This is, this is, and this is also remarkably mellow for me, this song. Right. Um, it's called Still Friends and it kind of came about because I was doing, there was a, there was a wee, well, it's still there in Glasgow, there's a tiny wee venue called The Hug and Pint on Great Western Road. It's, um, uh, oh God, what's the band called? Oh, I can't remember. Monday at The Hug and Pint, Arab Strap right. uh, band. Uh, I, 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 so well, Monday at the, the Hug and Pint. So the place is called The Hug and Pint. It's a downstairs, it's a brilliant venue. And it's more like a venue now than it's ever been. But in previous incarnations, that venue, I think it went to, when it was called the Roxy 171 after the New York place, uh, you could only get about 40 folk in. So if I was playing there, I would do two nights running, mm. uh, which kind of worked okay. And then, anyway, one of them, I'd gone to school. I went, uh, grew up in the West End of Glasgow and went near where the, the BBC used to be. And uh, all the folk in my class, I went to Hillhead Prime School, all the folk in my class, their parents were all kind of media folk and everything. So it was an mm. interesting place to grow up. But I hadn't seen these people from, I went to a different secondary school, and I hadn't seen some of these folk for a long, long, long time. Mm. And subsequently, between that and other people, so the song's not about them, but it's, it, it kind of evokes the, mm. the sort of feeling of it. So anyway, here we go. It's called Still Friends. <laughs> Thank you. 
Not many people know all the things that we've been through. We went our separate ways like we had to do. But now that time has passed, well, we all meet again. Not much seems to change, and we're still friends. Lovely. Mellow. <laughs> mellow, yes. And mellow banjo as well. Yeah, nice. Actually, that, that one's got a, a really kind of... A kind of soft sound for a banjo, if you know what I mean. It's not, yeah, not a very... A, it's not very edgy. I've never been a big fan of the sort of... Uh, well, it's funny, not like resonator guitars, but resonator banjos with that thing on the back. Yeah. Um, yeah, because that's an open back, isn't it? This is an open back, and it's much more of a, a kind of... It's so basic, and it's got yeah. an amazing pickup in it. Mm. Um, the first time that I played this live, because it's got a magnetic pickup, I thought, nah, it's maybe just going to sound like an electric, you know, like a guitar pickup. Yeah. And the first time that I went out to play it live was a, was a, a hall where we were doing the sound ourselves, and at the sound check I had a condenser mic in front of it. Mm. Still had it plugged in, the pickup plugged into my wires. I don't really like playing in front of mics because you have to can't run the stand right still <laughs> um, and be mindful of things, you know. Mm. Mindful. <laughs> um, and as it was, we didn't have to use the condenser mic at all because this pickup, mm. the head is called a cavanjo head. It's a deering head. The pickup is a magnetic pickup. It's not even active, and it's so basic. Mm. But it's it's kind of got the the banjo itself has got that kind of old timey. It's kind of more, more of a bluegrassy more of a sounding, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, not like that big. Yeah, you know, kind of clangy, clanky kind of banjo thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite delicate that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Now you were saying before that your your approach to songwriting is um, uh, is is to fool around the guitar till you find come up with something. I mean, do you have I? You know the cherry wine thing you were saying that just came from nowhere, really, just appeared. Do you ever do you ever plan anything on with a song? Do you ever think I've got this idea for a song, and you've got like a phrase or? I have got just something, or have you got two hundred things that recorded on your phone that you're going to work? I'm on just going to say, yeah, I've got a fucking mobile phone full of, and uh, the lock looking bra today. <laughs> things or things that when I'm drunk and I think oh, that's a great, that's a great hook for a song. And then I listen to Van Gogh and yeah. what was I thinking? Yeah. Um, I have got quite a lot of, you know, these kind of recordings and, and verses and notes in, in books and, and on com computer files and in, in, um, in Mac notes and on my phone notes and sketches. Yeah. Uh, very rarely does anything come of them. Sometimes I'll sit down, I'll try and make something up, but it always sounds a bit, to me, it always contrived. feels a bit contrived. Yeah. yeah. That is exactly the word. I don't know why. I don't know if it's, I try. And, well, it's funny. I've never, I've never think, thought that before, but what you've just said, I mean, cause I, I think um, a, a, a couple of months ago, I had come to that same conclusion and I, and I, um, tran I didn't delete them, but I transferred from my phone to my laptop 230 snippets of <laughs> of guitar riffs. I your pain. <laughs> and have I t have I touched any of them since? No. <laughs> what What will usually happen with me is I'll fart about the instrument, guitar, banjo, whatever, and I'll I'll maybe be, be thinking it. Or I'll try to, but invariably something else comes in and knocks that idea mm. away and invariably that whole idea will go in the bin mm. you know I, I'm not very good at giving things a chance I find mm. that if I the, the, my, my, or the songs of mine that I think are better mm. are songs that I've I, they're never really written in five minutes flat but they've kind no. of the essence of them and the theme has come together very quickly yeah. and it's been an instant yeah, I, I think you. I can do some of this sometimes there's been some songs and there's some songs that have actually now become some of my favourites that I've written and that I play live, 
but it took a long time because they were more, I don't really connect, well, it's pretty obvious I don't really craft my songs. Mm. And uh, But the ones I do, when I do try and overwork them or work on them, I, it's almost like I'm trying to put a square peg in a round hole. Right. And they become overworked and I'm never comfortable with them. Some of them survive mm. and eventually kind of evolve through farting about with them and, and kind of sort of fall into some kind of mm. something that I feel is, is a Dave Arcari song. Now, it's mm. weird because I do something on slide guitar that sonically sounds like me. Mm. And I'll think, that doesn't sound like a Dave Arcari song. And I can do something ridiculous, like pick up the banjo and come up with a song like I just played. Mm. But really, it's absolutely fuck all like anything else I do. <laughs> uh, but but yeah, to me, it sounds like a Dave Arcari song. Whether it does, it yeah, like yeah. No, else, I can say that. I don't know. So it's a, it's a, it's a really weird, uh, you know, if, if we could work out what what it is? What what did we have for breakfast today? We we wrote that song. What did how, how did it happen? Where, what if, what was the air temperature? Formula? Yeah, <laughs> because I'm fucked if I know. And but I, the thing is, I mean, the, the, you were saying that you rarely come back to things. Um, the thing that I, I'm, I've, obviously I've read quite a lot about various songwriters and a lot, particularly the sort of, you know, the Brill building era when those guys were, you know, were like rats in a cage and they, and, and they were just churning them out and they come out with one and think, well, okay, fair, no, all right, I'll start something else tomorrow. And they would come out with virtually like a song a day. And it was the same um, when we were, when we were in Memphis and we went to the Stacks, studio and the same stories come out all the time about well you know they were like churning songs out um so they must have thrown away a lot of dross in order to get the stuff that was that was really really memorable and i think that's quite a different way of songwriting to what maybe you and i do in the sense that we, we don't have a um a, a deadline we don't have you know we don't, we don't have our quota to do in a week before we get our, you know, wages sort of thing. So it's, sure. then we, we, we can afford to be slovenly about it, really, I suppose. But uh, I hang on, I've, just, I've got, just got a request come in here, and it says, can you ask about Dreamt I Was 100? Margaret MacDonald. Now, I wonder who that could be. <laughs> That's wife. I <laughs> realised that, that yeah. <laughs> 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 well, he'd said Margaret before, and I put two and two together. And, and she's also oh. saying she's saying hello to all the other people. A, f a few other comments you've got here. Eddie, who's um, a friend uh, from from uh, from from Talking Songs, is how I know him. He put uh, he's put lovely little ditty lad. He's also suggested hair dampeners for <laughs> for blinkers. But he says if songs are meant to be, they'll come back at you again. There you go. That's Eddie's approach yeah. on it. So what about Dreamt I Was 100 then? What's that? Oh, well, I'll give you a wee, I'll give you, I'll give you just an opening for it, just to give you a flavour. Uh, it's not something that I would plan on playing really, but, <laughs> but just, to, just, just to, get, to give it some context. Good. Shit, I can't remember. I've not played this for ages. So. Well done, Margaret. Well done. Dreamt I Was 100 Lovely. I like that. I like that a lot. Good choice, Margaret. Thanks for your help on that one. Yeah, that's a cracker, that one. I like that. I tell you what it reminded me of. Um, uh, a Ry Cuda album called My Name is Buddy. Do you know that one? Check it out. It's, it's ridiculous for a slide guitar player, but the only Ry Cuda stuff I know really is the stuff out of that uh, Crossroads film. Right. Well, it's he did he did three albums all about California, and my, my name is Buddy. Is about the unlikely friendship between a cat and a mouse, <laughs> and it's 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 a, a very very interesting tale because it's kind of uh, no pun intended. It's 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 about how um, the um, 
just because your folks tell you one thing or the folks you live with tell you one thing doesn't mean it's necessarily true. And there's, there's bits about race in it and there's bits about um, workers being on strike. There's all sorts of things on it. But there's a couple of tunes on it that have that exact feel. And a really, yeah. I think you'd like it. I, I would seriously, no, I recommend sure. that. My name is Buddy. It also it's a full story about the cat and the mouse, and in, there is a, there's an illustrated book with it as well. It doesn't oh, sound very really raikudri sort of thing to do, but it's brilliant. It's one of my faves. It's funny um, when, when I did that. By the way, it wasn't uh, anything about it, it. It was the cat's paw on the <laughs> mouse's tail. When you said the seal, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, anyway, but it's a funny <laughs> thing, that's from, I did a bunch of stuff a while back with a band called Alabama 3, mm. and uh, one of the two main guys uh, became a very good friend, uh, Jake, otherwise known as the Reverend D. Wayne Love, who unfortunately uh, died a couple of years ago, leaving a big hole, a very huge big hole, not just in the band, but in uh, music, but you know, everybody thought it was American, but it was from Postle in Glasgow, an off stage <laughs> spot like that, off stage spot like that. But you, you shouldn't get him wrong because he was a very fucking intelligent guy. <laughs> but he spoke like that. But he was an extremely well-read, intelligent guy and a, a great creative force. Anyway, I remember after doing a few shows with them, they, they must have got went. My, 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 I've got an EP called Blue Country Steel. Mm. It's the first solo physical CD that I did. Mm. Long gone out of out, 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 out of print or whatever it is, deleted from the catalogue, whatever. <laughs> and uh, anyway, they must have picked one of these up at the show, and it became a favourite on the Alabama Three Tour bus, and had forgotten mm. all about it. And he phoned up one day and said, "Your music's primordial." <laughs> I didn't know what the fuck primordial meant. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, it's funny. I woke up, but that that song was, was another one that just. Came, came out of thin air. I woke up one morning. Oh, God, that sounds like a fucking cliche. But I woke up one morning <laughs> yeah. and uh, and I'd had this dream. Or in my dream, I was 100. Hmm. And I was like, how did that happen? I'm 100. And I woke up and I was like, oh, it's all right. I'm only 95. <laughs> as, if it, as, if, as if five years at that stage of your life would make any difference, you know. So I, I had that. Uh, then there was a hundred. I was only ninety five. Yeah. And then, then it all just. I, I got got onto this thing about folk dying. <laughs> anyway, so that's for that. That's a little bit. <laughs> right then. I think on that point we'll go for another song, should we? <laughs> uh, let's go for let's go for another slide guitar song. <laughs> Is this the is this the prototype? I can't see very well. It's a little dark. Is this the, yeah, is this, the, the, is... the, the, the first one I played was a signature model. This yeah. actually, there were a couple of prototypes that um, I developed for nationals and a vintage steel back there. That's a nice one. But this, I was um, national guitars tended to be you know just a piezo, a Highlander mm. pickup in the biscuit. Or in the case of a trico or a magnophonic pickup system. Yeah. But anyway, they're both basically like acoustic systems. Mm. And they, they were kind of all right, a little bit harsh, and you know, they had that piezo kind of quack. Mm. Um and so I I've had a long, good, long and, and long relationship with National. And we were trying to put together some idea where there would be a magnetic pickup on the guitar as well. Mm. We'd kind of done this with the res electrics. Mm. And it's now the Reso Electric Revolver. That used to be just the Reso Electric. And then there's another one, kind of like like this. That was a was a Reso Electric Junior. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. One, yeah. one of my favourites. Um, that's now been superseded by a, a... I can't remember what it's called. Something else. <laughs> there's one sitting in New York in storage. But but this this one is based on a Delphi. And mm. there's another one based on a Stylo. And they both had the M2 necks on them because... It, Flat headstock's important for me because of the heavy strings. Mm. And, you know, they try and change slotted headstock, broken string on stage. You need to be quick. You kind of fart about Yeah, be fluffing about, wouldn't you? <laughs> and uh, so there was that, and I wanted a flat headstock. And I thought, right, let's try and let's try putting a magnetic pickup on it on a regular. Because mm. they had sent that. Well, one, we'd been over at the factory, and Don and Mac, well, Don's unfortunately dead now, and Mac left the company. But Don gave me a couple of lace slimline pickups and we stuck one in that Delphi. 
but it was very much that was very much a you know DIY stick it on and see what mm. happens. So this was a system basically with a Highlander in here, a Lawler pick humbucker here, a blend system, and also onboard power. Because one of the other problems with the Highlander systems is that they're active and you had to use a stereo cable and plug into a battery box. Oh, God. The batteries didn't die gracefully. They just mm. went from sound okay to sounding awful. Uh, it closed with four Phillips screws. So it really wasn't a gig friendly yeah. uh, on, on, on the hoof, you know, sorting things out. So it's like, I, I, and I also, I would like to use a wireless system. So, mm. so look, you know, we're going to have to put the power on board. So basically, this and a style O, similar style O, were the, the forerunners to the, the signature guitar. Um, and also forerunners probably to the Pioneer that they do as well, which is like a, it's like a res electric, but it's hollow and it's an awesome guitar. But this is just a, this is, so this is, this is basically a, a Delphi, but with an M2 neck and different pickup configuration. But the, of, of course, the pickups aren't plugged in tonight. <laughs> if anybody listened to my uh, live stream, I was part of the live, Wildcats live stream, I did have some very, Big nuclear holocaust overdrive type. So I'm going to play this very acoustically. It's a, it's a song called Got Me Electric. It's a title track way back from my second album. It goes Go on in. I don't mean I don't mean I was glad to get to the end. No, it's just that that, that slow down and, and the, the 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 final note on the top. Lovely, lovely. And the the first time I I, I mean the first time I ever heard anybody play uh, uh, any sort of steel guitar was a guy called Mike Cooper. Do you know that name? I don't know. 
No, oh, he lives in he lives in Rome now. But we we had a, a blues club in Swansea in the in the sixties, and um, we had all sorts of people there. Um, <laughs> Reverend Gary Davis played there. Um, wow. I, I saw I saw Mississippi Fred McDowell play there. Um, but uh, Mike Cooper was the first person who ever turned up. And I, I know I've told this story on the show before, but he, he, the, the room in which we, the performance took place was an upstairs room which had no lights in it, no PA system, nothing. The only lighting in there was one of those dartboard lights, you know, stuck on the wall. Yeah. And he was the, 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 the act, the turn would stand in front of that. And he took this national out of its case. And it just sparkled around the room like one of those glitter balls in a, in a Ritz ballroom sort of thing. And you could hear everybody going, still national, still national, still Because we'd never seen one before. And it was yeah. immaculate and it was glowing. And it was, it was like, wow. <laughs> that, was about, that was about 1969 I saw that. So when, um, when Reverend Gary Davis played there, he didn't have my pal Roy Bookbinder in tow, did he? I, I, to be honest with you, I, was not, I missed that one. That was really furious. I missed that one. I, I saw I saw Fred McDowell, but also we had quite a lot of the sort of the the the, the early uh, British blues people like Dave Kelly and Joanne Kelly, Tony McPhee. Joanne Kelly, did you ever come across a guy called Dick Wardell? I know the name. Uh, he he did a lot of stuff with Joanne Kelly, and uh, I managed his died a few years ago, but I managed him probably. In the mid nineties, right? Uh, so this yeah. this would have been like in the in the late sixties. Oh 70s. yeah, yeah, absolutely. But back then he did yeah. do a. But what that that, that that sounds vaguely familiar. That. Yeah. So anyway, listen, sorry, we're sorry. Um, we, we 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 could be flying on into hours of this if we're not careful. So <laughs> I think I what I what I'd like to do I think is you you've only done three and a half songs for us. I'm sure you had more than that lined up. Um, <laughs> I'll, go on. T give us give us one more song and something um something that's got a story to it that is a bit odd i'm sure you've got something juicy no oh, no juicy is not the word i'm looking for something that you've written because of something that happened somebody Play with met. My poodle. playing with your poodle <laughs> <laughs> is that some euphemism or what as you know, it was. I think it just came into my head because that was. I remember we went down to Workington to record a uh, with Dick Wardell to record an album for Fellside, and one of his songs was "Play with My Poodle." <laughs> so it was just when you said some juicy. I thought, oh, I <laughs> well, I suppose it's the great history of euphemisms in, in the blues, really, isn't it? You know. <laughs> Excellent. I'll tell you, I was going to play the first song I ever wrote, but... Oh, go on then. I'll tell you, I had another idea. Right, go on can then. either do the first song I ever wrote, or that I ever wrote that wasn't for a band. Right. Or um, there's a song, there's a guy called Steve Hooker down the south coast of, of, of England. It's a rockabilly guy, plays a bit of blues. Okay. He came to a few gigs I was playing, and he wanted me to record a track or write and record a track for an album he was producing that had a clothing theme. I think it was called Blue Jeans or something. So I wrote a song called Cotton on My Back. Um, so you can either have Cotton on My Back in open D, or you can have Good Friend Blues in open G. I think the, 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 one, the one in open D. The, clo the clothing song. <laughs> the, the, clo the clothing closing song. Right, this could... Uh... Just check it. I have no idea. It's funny, these songs I'm suddenly thinking of, and some of them I've not played for about two years. <laughs> it's COVID. Was it Red Jean Bop or something? Album? I can't remember. I can't remember what, what, the, what, the, what the album was called. But anyway, I just spelt my name wrong in the album. <laughs> but it's called uh, Cotton on My Back, which was about as close to clothing as I, as I could get.
another look. Might see something different. If you open up that book, oh, I might be a little messed up. But that don't get you right. To change it for the devil. I won't go out of fight. Oh, yeah. All the jaded losers, just give it a chance. Might see something different if you take another glance, cause I might be a little fucked up. But that don't get me right. Don't take it for a little. I won't go down the fight. Don't take it for a little. I won't go down the fight. Don't take it for the devil. I won't go without a fight. I remember that. Ha! Huh. I think you're still muted, Roland. I can't hear you. Roland is muted. You're muted. Oh, is it unlatched? Ah, oh, there you are. Ah, sorry about that. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I didn't think we'd have a problem in chatting for an hour. Um, <laughs> so, um, so you've got some sh you've got a show coming up in Glasgow shortly, I believe. Yes, yeah, Sunday the twentieth of February. Great venue called Broadcast. My good mm. pal Ian Donald, who is probably a guy that you should get in touch with. I actually go down to Stormers, uh, mm. aka the Gator. Um, all right, he's opening the show, uh, and it's bizarre. You know, trying to get back all the visa issues with the USA are like raising mm. their head, um, and. Try to catch up with venues. Most venues are, you know, they've had two years of rescheduling shows and yeah, all sorts. So it's kind of difficult finding the venues you want on on decent days. But anyway, yeah, it, it's a it's a real life live in person physical gig where we can sweat and spit on people and <laughs> all sorts of stuff. Drink whiskey and make merry. excellent. Excellent. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, yeah. Can you hear? Can you hear the howling in the background? That's my cat. I did hear some of those. <laughs> yeah. He's um, um he's he's twenty years old and he's deaf as a post, um and therefore he <laughs> he shouts rather loud. You can't no. It's, it's, poor thing. Poor thing. Um, oh, but he no. normally joins in at some stage during the show. So uh -huh, absolute yeah. pleasure, Dave. Um, really pleasure. If you're ever in this neck of the woods, or if I'm up in Loch Lomond, we shall we shall share a beer together and talk talk yeah, guitars definitely. and music. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. That'd be fantastic. So thanks, thanks for having me. Well, absolute pleasure. And uh, look after yourself. And uh, thanks to Margaret for her help. And thanks to Leslie, <laughs> my wife, for her help because she she's been downstairs sharing it out. She normally shares out to about a hundred different groups and oh, people during the course goodness. of the, the show. Um, you'll see her name is cropped up there as well. She's just said excellent show. Thank you, darling. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cheers, Dave. Stay safe. Cheers, Enjoy man. your cheese Cheers, sandwiches too. without feeling guilty. <laughs> <That's all. laughs> oh, that was good. I didn't think we'd have any problem in chatting for an hour. Um, what, what have we got from Eddie? Uh, love your slide style, it says here. There you go. Um, Eddie Cook, the cat's got ear dampeners. <laughs> Steady, Eddie, if you've been smoking again. Um, so anyway, thanks thanks for thanks for dropping by. Thanks. For, good to see you. Good to see you again, Eddie. Actually, you've not been for a few weeks, have you? And lots of people who um, have come in from your neck of the woods, I, I suspect, Dave. And I think Margaret's uh, been... Um, calling people in as well oh thank you john um yeah so uh all around good success i enjoyed it and um um i do i've always had this thing about playing slide that i don't know how to do it and i've tried and i've tried and it just i don't know i can't get my head around it at all i don't know why but there you go so that's it. That's it for this week. Um, I can't for the life of me remember what I've got on next week. Um, I know we've got we've got um, Sally Barker coming up in a few weeks. Um, she was due to do it a few weeks ago, but she was poorly. And um, lots of other people cropping up. Um, 
I may well be starting to do it every fortnight in the future because gigs are starting to come in and um, Tuesdays is quite, is quite, and I don't want to start recording them because I'd rather do them live uh, with all the, all the risk that that entails. Um, so um, I shall see you all next week, I hope. And uh, in the meantime, look after yourselves and um, have fun and listen to plenty of music and play plenty of music. So um, I shall leave you with my own little, um, um, where's it gone? There it is. This is the promo for the new album I, I've just released with uh, Bo Lee on bass and Ian Miller on percussion. So this is um, Live at Oswest Street is the album. And this is a track called That's How It Is. I've been thinking about where I've been. The places I've visited, the things I've seen Made decisions by people I've met Some were good ones and some I regret Don't know the future, can't change the past That's how it is, that's how it is